Have you ever stopped to think about yourself and your story? If someone were to write your memoir, what would it say? We all seek some level of authenticity, but have trouble removing the labels and finding our whole story. Welcome to Dropping In with Diane Dewey. In this program, we'll explore diverse stories on identity to help determine what is truly yours. Now, here is your host, Diane Dewey. Welcome to the show, one and all. We're glad to have you with us in the virtual community that is Internet Radio. Before we turn to the genius of writer Barbara Lynn Probst, I want to address what's going on in our world to express gratitude for the caregivers and to say our hearts go out to those who are sick or unemployed. And I want to offer Hawaiian aloha because today's guest also takes us back to Hawaii. Aloha, the kindness and respect to everyone for writing this out together. Because of the coronavirus pandemic and our emotional roller coaster these days, when we say to ourselves, oh no, not that person, or oh no, not that place to close, or that business to stop employing, we are, like Viktor Frankl, author of Man's Search for Meaning, no longer able to affect our environment or control our environment. And that in and of itself is a loss to be mourned, even aside from the loss of death. As a Holocaust survivor and someone who lived in a concentration camp for a couple of years, Viktor Frankl knew what he was talking about. He went on to note that in some way, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. In searching for meaning, I think we have to ask ourselves, who are we? As a people, as a human race, what is our identity? On dropping in, the subject is always identity. Can we make sacrifices for the common good and still protect ourselves, our community, and our work? That's part of our identity. There is a time and a season for everything, sang the birds in 1965 in their song, Turn, Turn, Turn. And there is a purpose to this too, although it's hard to see sometimes. With social distancing, we can either be cranky or use the solitude in our favor. As a friend of mine said, it feels like being a kid when we were sent to our room to think about what we did wrong. I'd like to think it's a time when we can figure out how to make things right, or at least better for now and after this, to try to close the inequalities that we have in our systems in healthcare, the disparities in wealth, corporate gain over community prosperity that even the world's biggest banks acknowledge to be unhealthy and to curb the violations to our planet, um, who might, which might just be so angry with us that it has unleashed this virus. Each of these scenarios and challenges to our identity requires the triumph of science over greed. The COVID-19 causes us to stay at home, and some of us, like writers or artists, are used to being home and alone most of the day with our work. We find our thoughts in quietude, even loneliness. Look at the creative isolation of Georgia O'Keeffe in New Mexico. She's the subject of the book, Queen of the Owls, and our guest is the author, Barbara Lynn Probst. The book is coming out in April next month from She Writes Press, and I couldn't be more excited about it. Here's a little bit about the author, and you'll see why. Barbara Lynn Probst is a writer of both fiction and nonfiction, living on an historic dirt road in New York's Hudson Valley. Her debut novel, Queen of the Owls, April 2020, is the powerful story of a woman's search for wholeness, framed around the art and life of iconic painter Georgia O'Keeffe. Queen of the Owls has been selected as one of 20 most anticipated books of 2020 by a working mother, and it will be the May 2020 selection for Pulpwood Queens, a network of nearly 800 book clubs across the United States. Her second novel, The Sound Between Notes, will be published, will be published next year in April 2021. Barbara is also the author of the ground, groundbreaking book on nurturing out-of-the-box children when labels don't fit, Random House 2008. She has a PhD in clinical social work. She blogs for several award-winning sites for writers and is a serious amateur pianist. To learn more about Barbara and her work, please see 
probst.com, B-A-R-B-A-R-A-L-I-N-N-P-R-O-B-S-T.com. Welcome, Barbara. Thanks for being with us with all you have on your plate and for taking the time to drop in from California where it's very early. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, I'm honored just listening to your opening. I'm just so grateful that you're giving voice so beautifully to what we're all feeling. It's a very strange thing, you know, to be talking about one's book when there's so much it seems so much more important going on. But I thought about this, and in a way, if I can see this as something I can actually give, it mm-hmm. really helps me get out of the whole sort of self-promotion box and feel that maybe my story can bring something to people that in a, in a strange way might even help. It's true. I mean, it does feel like a parallel universe, even to me. Um, But, you know, here we are secluded and sequestered in some cases in isolation and actually needing not just escape through reading, exactly, but but also a sense of of unity and a sense of, you know, your book is about developing wholeness. Um, It's a wonderful debut novel. I I totally understand your misgivings about talking talking about it, but please understand that I think for all of us, um, we can't exist without one another and one another's messages and stories become all the more important. Um, It's hard for me to believe that this is a debut novel. It's really got everything going for it, story, character, desire, um, a message, and a gorgeous title, I just have to tell you. (laughs) The other day, so Queen of the Owls, the other day I I had to do some essential travel by plane um, earlier in the week, and the man in the row behind me ran up and tapped me on the shoulder after we deplaned. Um, there were very few, few of us on the flight. He asked me about the manuscript I was reading, Queen of the Owls, and he said, what a great title. What is it about? <laughs> and I told That's him, great. it was great. And I told him it's about a woman, a bookish owl of a woman, finding herself as a whole. And he said, great, I'll buy it for my wife. She loves owls. <laughs> Yes, well, there's no owls in the book, you know. I know. I told him she'll love it. She, you know, I think yeah, she yeah. will just um, the universality of it. But I, I thought you'd enjoy just um, thank you just how the <laughs> yeah, how the great. even the title connected to people. So, so how did you originally become interested in George O'Keefe, Barbara? Was it an obsession for you somehow, or well, how did this all know, begin? It's, no, it's re- it's actually very funny, Diane, that, you know, in thinking about how to talk about the book, I sort of, things have appeared to me that I forgot. Um, I can't even remember when the idea first came to me, because I always liked her work, but I didn't really Mm -hmm. know that much about it. And it wasn't until I was giving another interview, I was sitting in front of, I have a huge poster of her, um, famous poppy painting, and I was giving this interview, and all of a sudden, it hit me. When, when I got uh, divorced and my, my ex uh, departed, there was a big blank spot over the fireplace where he used to have his TV, and I wanted to put something up there that really represented me and the me I wanted to be, and I got this giant O'Keefe poster. This was mm-hmm. years ago. And I, it suddenly, it's so when talking about the book, 12 years later, it suddenly hit me that that image, that what O'Keefe brought, always had been a kind of image beyond words for me mm-hmm. of, the, of what it meant to be a really whole, embodied, glorious woman. But I hadn't made the connection. It's really kind of wild. Um, right. So well, these things happen. Yeah. They happen, and I love that you were filling a void. That, that's another thing that I just think is, is beautiful. Yeah. About it. Um, and I think you made a really articulate case in the book about how these flower paintings are not to be taken literally, 
Um, you know, there's a lot of alliteration about in comparison to female form with O'Keeffe's uh, flower paintings. But I love how you just described it as kind of an emboldening and opening, um, a kind of flourishing. And that um, happens in the book, too, with the protagonist, mm-hmm. Liz, a doctoral student in art history. She feels her way out of her trapped self and her life of perfunctory routines as a wife and a mother of two. These needn't be perfunctory, but in her case, they were. Um, Liz is studying George O'Keefe, and she finds herself transfixed um, and instinctively drawn to her. And O'Keefe becomes a kind of an avatar for her own latent mm-hmm. desire, right? Um, and I guess I wonder, you know, would we have seen... Oh, you've got a, you've got a little one. Yeah, yeah. He, she just decided to start meowing during the recording. <laughs> oh, oh, well, okay. We're we're here with the felines, the the cat, the cat, cat woman. Okay, this is good. Um, yeah, yeah. With, Sorry, we ignore her. Okay. All right, no problem. We you know have a dog in the closet. He actually likes it there, so it's okay. Um, but O'Keefe, you know, she becomes a kind of an avatar for the latent mm-hmm. desires of Liz. Maybe Liz doesn't quite understand them in the beginning either. Uh, you know, kind of like you know what you were describing. And I just wonder, you know, we would would we would she have known? Would she have been able able to feel her way out of this box without somebody like George O'Keefe? Yeah. It's a really great question. Um, what's so interesting is, um, you know, as I was thinking about this interview and um, some of the questions I knew you would be posing, I realized that there were things in the book that I did that I didn't even realize I was doing. And I think I'm just going to take a sidebar for a second that what I love about writing fiction is that it really lets you connect the subconscious and the conscious That is, there's material that you understand in a sort of wordless way, and somehow it connects with the word-making part that's able to give it a form. So I say that because in the very beginning of the book, it starts with Elizabeth wanting to take Tai Chi. She was tired of watching from the outside how Mm -hmm. the people, and admiring how people were so fluid in their bodies. She wanted to understand it from the inside. And that, it suddenly struck me that that was exactly what her journey was with O'Keeffe's art. That in starting out, admiring it as an observer, cerebrally, intellectually, she had to let the art enter her, or she Mm -hmm. had to enter it. I'm not sure which way, well, maybe both. And mm-hmm. really, really come to know that what this meant in a way that was much more than mental, but truly embodied. So I think yes. that that's really the journey. Now, could it have been a different artist? Who knows? O'Keefe is, was perfect. And of course, once the idea came to me, I began to research O'Keefe. I learned so much about her that also in, informed the story. And at this point, I can't imagine it any other way. Right. I mean, and I I think this idea of um, observing versus inhabiting or allowing Mm -hmm. something to inhabit you, I mean, it really, it can be anything, but it's because we're always changing as well. But these are things that worm their way into ourselves. Like we, we walk away from the painting in the exhibition, and I love the red poppies. We've even got one here in St. Petersburg in the museum. Um, it's 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 like you've left the image, but the after image is already embedded in you. Or when you're standing in front of the painting, you walk through it. You go mm-hmm. into and you you feel as though you can capture or cap you can go into the mind's eye of the artist. And I think that that communication, that illusion, is exactly it could be prompted by by many things. But I mean, it's right. really. Um, and I loved, I mean, and I, well, first of all, I, I, I really enjoy that you give this kind of candid disclosure that some of the things that come out in your book, you look at afterwards and they're discoveries of unconscious things that you did unwittingly. Um, but mm-hmm. I think that the, the conscious, the Tai Chi, for example, where your body is giving form and through that comes an energy um, a power through through doing Tai Chi. There's something really um, emblematic about that as well. 
Um, mm, and absolutely. I, and yeah, so mm. that, that was amazing and, and immediately had my attempt my attention but then right away after if that wasn't enough in tai chi is richard the ultra attractive (laughs) photographer we learn he's a photographer because liz and richard go out for coffee after tai chi class a little bit of an ixnay when you're a married mother of two with the dad waiting for you to come home but okay she goes there and they start having this conversation about o'keefe because of course richard knows all about Alfred Steiglitz. And Steiglitz photographs o- O'Keefe in this groundbreaking series of nudes. And, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, that's the counterpart to the paintings, right? Mm-hmm. How was that in your journey? You mean about, did I, did I pose nude? No, no, Just but kidding. did you, no, well, you <laughs> well, know, actually, let's I not rule it out, okay? Let's just <laughs> Well, that's what I say. I, I say not yet. Not um, yet, exactly. Not Thank yet. you. <laughs> but actually, the counterpart, well, you know, we take, the, as a writer, you take things that you've experienced and you find the kind of emotional essence, and then I like to say that you re-embody it in an invented scene. So this idea of being seen, of being revealed, or revealing oneself, right, which is what, that's the epitome, um, what actually happened to me that was um, sort of that helped me help me write those scenes was that I'm somebody who always hated to have my picture taken. I mean, all the, the albums with my kids, you know, they have no mother because I'm always the one taking pictures of everybody else. Mm-hmm. So during the course of starting to write the book, and I, I wanted to redo my website, and I hired a professional photographer, to do the headshot. And he was amazing. We spent the whole afternoon. He must have taken 100 shots. And at a certain point, I stopped posing. I just was there. And the the whole thing changed. The the headshot we ended up using was one of the last ones. Mm -hmm, And so there was something about letting go and giving, letting mm-hmm. my Im- just letting myself be seen from the neck up, indeed. But but there was the emotional experience of that that I felt I could enlarge mm-hmm. and understand what it would be for Elizabeth to really let herself be seen. Now with O'Keefe, it was it's much yeah. more complicated. I mean, it's a big controversy it is, about whether it is, she it is it is, compli- right, right. it is complicated with O'Keefe and we're gonna come back to her. We're um, just up at the moment where we need to take a short break. Um, it comes up very quickly, but I, I do love the whole um, release of self, release of essence of self in photography. Um, and I I wonder if we can come back from the, we'll come back from the break and we'll talk about Georgia O'Keeffe and we're going to talk about Kim Kardashian and how maybe she wouldn't even exist without Stieglitz nudes of O'Keeffe. We'll talk about selfies and acceptance of our body image and all of it. We're with Barbara Lynn Probst on Dropping In. Don't go away. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Has your manuscript languished because you can't find the direction it wants to take? Or have you lost the motivation to finish and polish it for publication because it can be such a big, formidable task? Let Diane Dewey help you resolve your writing issues. Diane's manuscript coaching offers help with sticking points like the arc of your story and how to flesh it out. Finding the inner story and what you want to say. Developing your message, the revelations that become your reader's takeaways, helping to rally the motivation to finish your project, and what to do next. We can analyze, edit, and advise you on publishing. Who are the next collaborators on your writing path? If you seek resolution to these and other questions, please contact Diane Dewey, author of the award-winning memoir, Fixing the Fates. Find her at truenordmedia.com. That's T-R-U-N-O-R-D media.com. Or on her author's page, dianedewey.com. Diane can also be found through social media. Connect with her through the links on the show page. 
Are you finding your frequency? It can be described as that space between failure and success. It's the future of digital media. It's finding your voice. It's engaging topics, content, and ideas. Jeff and Ryan discuss the digital media space and all of its aspects. It's about making the mistakes, taking the chances, summoning the intestinal fortitude to step out of your comfort zone, and discovering what you can accomplish when you decide to try, decide to learn, decide that you have something to say, and find your frequency. Live Fridays at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Stimulating talk it gets those synapses in your brain firing really fast. All the time. The number one Internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com. You are listening to Dropping In with Diane Dewey. We'd love to hear from you if you have a question or comment about the show. Send us an email to ddewey at truenordmedia.com. That's the letter D, dewey at trunordmedia.com. Now, back to Dropping In. Welcome back. We're here with Barbara Lynn Probst, author of Queen of the Owls, a great title and a great book, I can attest. Um, We had just touched on the subject of nudity in photographs, not in a sensational way, I must say, but as a way of self-expression for the subject who then, of course, as Barbara just alluded with Georgia O'Keeffe and her series of photographs by Alfred Stieglitz, there was the sense and the controversy over whether she was objectified, exploited, manipulated, and all of these questions are wrestled with in your book, Barbara. Um, if you'd like to go there, it's you're, you're welcome to. I just feel as though there's a certain um, feminist refusal to be objectified that maybe has evolved since the time that the photographs were taken. You mean since, since O'Keefe's photographs were taken? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's very, it's complicated. And in fact, there's the whole the fact that um, Elizabeth is teaching a course on feminist art. Elizabeth and is so, a protagonist, yeah. Yeah, right, which, which has many permutations. And again, that was something else that, that I had to learn about, different right. um, interpretations of what it means to be a feminist. And, you know, I mean, O'Keefe was a very complicated character, and mm-hmm. she enjoyed being a bit mysterious. So... Um, in the end, she says, basically, let the, let the paintings speak for themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And refuse right. to let anyone else's interpretation of her life or her work, um, I mean, they could do it if they wanted, but, but she would not let anyone else define who she was. And in a way, that's what Elizabeth comes to as well. Yeah. She, needs to, she needs to forge her own identity, not in imitation of Georgia O'Keeffe, but who she is. Right. There's a lot of power in that, right? Owning it and claiming it for yourself, the interpretation. And I think that what you touched on with George O'Keefe's mysteriousness, I mean, she really paved the way. Artists continuously Mm -hmm. say, um, you know, let the work speak for itself. That, you know, I don't want to write wall texts. I don't want to write catalog essays. I want the person, the viewer, to come in and interact with the art. That's it. The experience. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that's, that's a very interesting point, and it clearly originated with her. Oh, absolutely. I mean, she was, was just adamant. She hated being called a female artist. She said, I'm right. an artist. I'm a mm-hmm. female. What, how are the two related? I mean, we don't talk about people as male artists. So, in a way, she was the quintessential feminist who wanted to be beyond gender. Exactly. It's really the fascinating. Only, yeah. It's, yeah. It's totally fascinating. There's a slight glitch in the works when you allow yourself to be photographed as a woman by a man who becomes your husband. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, so there's, you know, and I won't, you know, I, I don't, I really don't discount um, George O'Keefe. If anything, I think the paradox that she embraces is absolutely central to all of our beings. We have these paradoxes going on. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, um, I think about the feminist, you know, Gloria Steinem. She, you know, with her aviators and her hipster bell bottoms, look, she was fabulous looking, is fabulous mm-hmm. looking. 
Yeah, um, there's also so, a story, that, I have to tell you, that story that, yeah. that, I don't know if it's true, that Steinem went to visit O'Keefe with a bouquet of flowers and O'Keefe refused to let her in. Um, <laughs> right, because of her <laughs> symbolic, I mean, not that they weren't kind of soul sisters in a way. I mean, here's, I here's Steinem, you know, really, she really combines the, the physical, mental yeah. uh, consciousness. And I think your book really kind of argues for a holistic approach to this without being pedantic, and that's very, very cool. You, re- you yeah. reveal a certain philosophy, um, and I, I've, I'm quoting from your website, um, life is a mosaic, each piece contributing to the design, helping us to discover who we are and where we belong. And, mm-hmm. You know, how beautiful is that? And I, mm-hmm. I wonder if you can comment on this idea of a mosaic rather than a you know, a fragment or, you know, a cerebral part or a physical part, but not a combination of all these things. Yeah, I, you know, I'd forgotten about that, but it it's true. I don't think we kind of forge a self in a linear way. It Different experiences, people that we meet, things that we do, places we travel, whatever, it all kind of comes together in... Uh, you might even call it a kaleidoscope, rather, because it's, mm-hmm. we change all the time, right? And so I've done a lot of really wild things in my life, and I feel like I feel glad for every single one of them because they've all sure. helped to make me the person that I am. And I really, the older I get, the more I don't buy into a linear approach to really anything, so, right. um, um, we're not yeah. going to let you off the hook because if you said you've done wild things, we want to know all about them. Um, <laughs> you know, well, maybe not a, that well. <laughs> well, no, but, you know, no, but I, I have, I am aware of the fact that you know you you've lived in a variety of places, um, and I know that. Let's see, I, you know, I find that also you're just fascinating as a person. Not surprisingly. Um, being an, the author that you are, you've lived in a cabin in the California Redwoods, a firehouse, a converted sauna in the heart of Greenwich Village, <laughs> and lots of places in between. You now live yeah. on a historic dirt road in New York Hudson's Valley, New York's Hudson Valley. Tell us about that. How does home and place weigh into your identity? How's that woven in? Mm, you mean, well, I mean, right now I'm really lucky because I live in a place that's pretty secluded. It's really important to me to have quiet. My office is like very zen. I have a glass desk. I really uh-huh. need to, it's just, I need, I need to um, not be suggested to by external. Some people like to have music and objects that inspire them. I really mm-hmm. need to have a very pristine setting. So that's how... I mean, I'm fortunate for sure, um, but I mean, I had a you know I had a very busy full house at one point when I raised my kids who were wild. They were completely, you know, not so kids, and so I did that at one time. But that's a real contribution, I, did, you know, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, right now, that's I find that I do need that that uh, stillness in mm-hmm. order to let that creativity emerge. And the other thing I want to say for myself about the piano, I really, one of my writing teachers is also an amateur, serious amateur painter. And I think we both felt that to have another form that is not based on words is really restorative. So when I go to the piano and study, it, it's a different part of me. And that helps a lot. Right. So, um, yeah, and I'm also a believer that every person you meet is a potential teacher. So you can't be a good writer unless you're totally fascinated by people and by life. So that's the the flip side to the stillness of, of the desk, right? Right, right. And I think, you know, your, your character, Liz, she's a teacher for all of us. And you, you've made her a teacher because we've we've gone on the path with her um and i think you know this is this is the value of it right but i i love this idea of focusing on something completely different um non-verbal all right so you're you're a writer but you're now transferring to the piano the keys of a piano or as another wonderful author uh, that i know Anne hood she knits 
And Mm -hmm. knitting, you know, it's another thing that requires manual dexterity. And, you know, you you are a PhD. You you can tell us more than I could. But, you know, this this sense that your hands tell you something. The way you learn through your hands is different than the way you learn from creating words. Um, And that this physical sense through your hands. It's it's very key, and it's something you know. It comes up a lot in in talk about um, kids being on computers all the time, because look, they're not doing things with their hands. So, are you know, is there sort of part of the brain that is even kind of um, going to rest as a result yeah. of you know focusing particularly on language? So, I, I think that's a beautiful. I think that's a beautiful point. I wonder if you would talk about, uh, there was a dialogue between Richard and Elizabeth, and at one point I thought, oh, let's read it. Um, but, you know, talking to you is far more interesting. So um, there's this dialogue between them. He's the photographer. He believes that a person's essence can come out in a fragment. Um, and these fragments, you have to get a lot of them, or, or, or she believes that there's a composite. He believes that you can see it through a fragment. This dialogue goes on. Um, and Georgia O'Keeffe herself said, when you take a flower in your hand and really look at it, it's your world for the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how do you relate to that, the, the sense of the whole or a fragment mm. translating into a whole Somehow you know, it's, it's funny. Again, I, I'm loving this interview, Diane, because now I'm seeing the connection with this mosaic idea that I put on my website two years mm-hmm. ago, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't even see the true. connection until right now. Yeah. But it will, just to answer your question and then I'm slightly enlarging it, Elizabeth's relationship with Richard is meant to be a little bit enigmatic. I mean, I did not want them, spoiler alert, but I did not want it to be an affair. That is so cliche and uninteresting. It's, it's seductive, but in a whole bunch of other subtle ways, right? So this kind of dance that they're doing about holes and parts is part of the, um, uh, the, the, the dance that they're doing. And um, of course, Elizabeth is looking for the whole. Mm-hmm. Um, she's talking a, a good talk about it intellectually, but it's only later in the book that she comes to understand it truly, right? So when they're having the conversation initially, it's a theory. And so right. her theory becomes her reality exactly. by the end of the book, right? Right, yes, and... This, I, what, even though you gave a spoiler alert, um, I, of course, was flipping the pages. I, I did not go ahead to find out if they actually got to bed together. But I did. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, quite all right. Because, I tell you why. Because the journey is half the fun and their dialogue is sizzling. Um, mm-hmm. she, she, she was acute. Here's, Elizabeth was acutely, shockingly aware of Richard's fingers on her skin. I mean, he did touch her. A place that she never paid attention to that was now the most intensely alive part of her. I mean, this is pretty sensual and pretty intense. And I think mm-hmm. that, you know, you know, you can go through this book and their their relationship and just feel it. I mean, mm-hmm. really feel it almost better than if you actually tried to capture copulation, which is a really difficult thing to do, but also these parts are maybe even much more um, poignant. It's really, yeah. um, it, it's, it's very, it's, you know, the, the heat rises up in her face. She had to keep talking or she'd lose herself in the sensation of his touch. I mean, these are things um, that I just, you know, p- p- scenes that I just, I loved. And then, of course, she can go back and quote O'Keefe to bail herself out of this tongue-tiedness. And she says, I often painted fragments of things because it would seem to make my statement better than the whole could. And there you have it. The fragment of this relationship, rather than the culmination, was more expressive. Exactly. Um, He's touching her elbow, in fact, in that scene, right? It's an elbow, which is a really unerotic part of one's body, in a way. You know? And, um, yeah, so it's... Yeah, it's an interesting question. And the other thing I'd just say is that 
um, when I wrote those very sensual uh, passages, and there's no sex, I mean, it's, well, there's nothing, it, there's, you know, there's no, it doesn't, you, you can be sensual without describing people having sex. So right. that's, and it's also, of course, in contrast to the very unsensual relationship with her husband. So that's, that's part of the, the contrast there. But the other thing I really try to do when I'm writing something like that is I actually try to sense it in my own body. Sure. And write what I am experiencing. It's the same process as, is what my protagonist is describing. You can't write just from the mind. Right. You have to touch, you have to be in touch with your, your emotions, your body, your instinct, your whole self to write in a way that's alive. And you, you have brought this forth from yourself um, so exquisitely that, I mean, there are times in the book that you can just get completely lost in it. I really think that it's clear that you were summoning uh, yourself. Um, and also, it's very clear that the, the protagonist, Liz, has, you know, she's become somewhat arid, right? Somewhat dry. She's gotten lost in the role, that she's, the roles that she plays. And she has just lost contact, that contact with her sensory self, the contact with her um, her emotional self. And I think that there's a temptation, or I wonder if you agree with this, there's a temptation sometimes towards over-mentalizing and um, perfectionism that we women sometimes, uh, in an urge to get things right, forget that we have bodies. Um, I've spoken with women who've had big careers in finance, and, um, and they've said to me, I, I thought my body was a vehicle for my brain. I forgot mm. I even had a body. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, if you want this, if you want this to come back alive, read this book. It really, um, it really does put you back in touch with yourself. And I, um, I really want to delve into this. We're going to take another break here in a few minutes, but maybe you could just um, comment on that. The there's a a, par- a passage where Elizabeth says um, to her class, "Could we say that attitude is an aspect of identity?" a set of beliefs that lead one to embrace a specific identity. Um, so this is, this is a very mental compartmentalized thing, right? Um, mm-hmm. And you went mm-hmm. from there to where in, you know, 60, 60 seconds we have left. You, what, what happened after well, that? Yeah, yeah, well, that was who she was in the beginning, right? She's, she's only thing she trusts is her mind. And uh, again, your question of wholeness, authenticity, who am I? Really, and that's that's the whole. I mean, that's why I relate so much to to your show and to what you stand for. So, yeah. Well, thanks. I I think that um, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about the ways that Liz was empowered by showing herself and she, taking the risk that she took. Uh, I think defying herself, defying the boundaries that she previously previously had in place, um, and becoming a woman that subconsciously. She always wanted to be. We're with Barbara Lynn Probst, and we'll be back in just a second. Don't go away. Voice America is on your favorite smart speaker. If you have Alexa or Google Home, go ahead and give us a try. Hey, Alexa, play Finding Your Frequency podcast on TuneIn. Has your manuscript languished because you can't find the direction it wants to take? Or have you lost the motivation to finish and polish it for publication because it can be such a big, formidable task? Let Diane Dewey help you resolve your writing issues. Diane's manuscript coaching offers help with sticking points like the arc of your story and how to flesh it out, finding the inner story and what you want to say, developing your message, the revelations that become your reader's takeaways, helping to rally the motivation to finish your project, and what to do next. We can analyze, edit, and advise you on publishing. Who are the next collaborators on your writing path? If you seek resolution to these and other questions, please contact Diane Dewey, author of the award-winning memoir, Fixing the Fates. Find her at truenordmedia.com. That's T-R-U-N-O-R-D media.com. Or on her author's page, dianedewey.com. Diane can also be found through social media 
Connect with her through the links on the show page. Are you or someone you know interested in attending college? With both college tuition and college enrollment up 60% since 2002, there is a lot of competition, and careful planning needs to be a part of the process. Tune in to Getting In, a College Coach Conversation, hosted by Elizabeth Heaton and featuring a team of college coach experts. We'll bring you the tips, techniques, and know-how to navigate the road to college and do so the smart way. Listen live every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio, voiceamerica.com. You are listening to Dropping In with Diane Dewey. We'd love to hear from you if you have a question or comment about the show. Send us an email to ddewey at truenordmedia.com. That's the letter D, dewey at trunordmedia.com. Now, back to Dropping In. Welcome back, everyone. We're dropping in with Barbara Lynn Probst, the author of a beautiful new book called Queen of the Owls. It's just as enticing as it sounds, and it's coming out next month, April 2020, from She Writes Press. The, um, before the break, the previous thought was about being seen, and there's a fine line, right, Barbara? I think this is something um, you really picked up on. There's this fine line, being seen, on the one hand, Liz, your protagonist, and this is a novel, it's a work of fiction, but so lifelike, you'll be gripped by it. Um, Liz, she's, she's drifted away from herself. She has to come back to herself. And she's empowered by showing herself in a series of nude photographs that she does uh, outside of her marriage, obviously, um, with a photographer that she meets in her Tai Chi class. Um, there is the tension um, between the viewer and the gaze of the person who has the power on the other side of the camera. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to talk about that and how that interacts with a person, a sense of self for Liz or for any of us. I mean, between the person who is being seen and the one who is seeing? Yeah, because you were describing, and I thought so well, you were describing your own photo session, not nude, but and from the head up of, you know, releasing yourself into the camera of the observer mm-hmm. who was taking your picture I think we've all had that experience where we find ourselves dropping our guard. And once yeah. we, we do, it's something happens. Yeah, you know, I would actually think, I would re- reframe what you said a little bit differently, that um, we're usually trying to present a, a persona, a role. Here I am, you know, brilliant scholar. Here I am, devoted mother. We're trying to pose in, as a certain image of something. And it's a funny word, pose, isn't it? Because it is. the, the best models are, are people who are not posing. They just are being. And right. so if this, in, in dropping the effort to, to try to look like something and just look like myself, just be mm-hmm. me, that's where the liberation comes. And... Again, in a way, the book is also about finding her authenticity behind the roles. And the roles are, it's important. You you want to be a good mother. You want to be a good daughter, a good whatever, you know. But but there's something else that's missing, that real identity, that real sense of, that children have before they (laughs) learn to pose. So there's something about that. That's really how I see it. Absolutely. And I think that's right. Where something, it falls away. Something falls away mm-hmm. from you. And, and I think the pose, the posture, the position, the role, all of those things are so closely tied together. Um, and I think, you know, we do see it when someone's in repose as opposed to posing. Mm, um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. The, the interesting way a person looks when they're in repose um, I think that's that's the subtlety. Um, I, I do. 
I do, I guess there, there is a way, and I think you've just been so articulate about that, but th- there is a way in which the, the male gaze has this now, um, you know, cliche kind of power. Um, it isn't necessarily male. It's really just an other, right? It's an, how others see us. And mm-hmm. um, in, in your book, you know, you're talking about um, Stieglitz and George O'Keefe, and you say, if Stieglitz was creating his art, Georgia couldn't create hers. Mm-hmm. And yet, by giving him her time and body, she found her own beauty. And out of that, her art changed. In being mm-hmm. seen, she saw. In being seen, she saw. So there's also a role, an appreciation of being observed as well. It's a very interesting tension to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't really know what O'Keefe felt. I just there's a sideline to this here too. I take certain perhaps liberties. O'Keefe is not a character in the story. You know, she doesn't walk into the room and and have coffee with the protagonist. Is if this were a historical novel, so we're seeing O'Keefe through Elizabeth's eyes, and it's certainly possible that O'Keefe scholars might get annoyed that I've taken liberties with, with her, but it's important to remember that, that this is how, this is what she means to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth's interpretations of O'Keefe are telling us about Elizabeth, right? But O'Keefe herself, I mean, we don't know what she really felt. Um, she, she said very little, all that, the only thing we really know, there was a letter she wrote to her good friend Anita Pollitzer, when she said that she thought that the photos that Stieglitz took actually had very little to do with her. Um, right, they had to do feel, with them. <laughs> yeah, she didn't feel like personally identified or, you know, with them. It's kind of fascinating. Um, it is fascinating. And, mo- and the nude models do feel that way too, you know. It's, they're just, they don't take it personally. Right. Um, well, it's kind of hard not to, though, when you're there and you're naked. But I do understand what you're saying. And, I, you know, I think the other detail about their dynamic is that, you know, Stieglitz was George O'Keefe's dealer in the beginning. She was yes. the one, he was the one, sorry, who discovered her work. And so, uh, you know, it, other people say, you know, it's promotional that he took these photographs of her. I, I don't think that, you know, I have a fair amount of art history background and I you know, worked at the Guggenheim Museum for, for you know, half a dozen years or more. And, um, and I, I know a little bit about appropriation. And I don't think there's much in this book that would be in conflict because, as you say, O'Keefe is an avatar. She's a symbol mm-hmm. for Liz. And it's really through Liz's eyes that are totally subjective that exactly. we see O'Keefe and what she comes to symbolize for her. Um, and I think that is um, that is the ability of an artist to speak to us. And it's something that happens through that subjectivity, through the experience of the, you know, of the artist's work. So in that way, I can only say I think O'Keefe would kind of approve of this internalizing that, that went on. <laughs> you know, it's kind of great, you know, that did, and also much less the liberation because we know that eventually O'Keefe did go off. Um, to New Mexico and live um, quite separately from from Stieglitz. Um, I wondered, here I know we talked about unconscious things that cropped up in your book, and, um, you know, aside from the things, the, the, these are spontaneous things, and I wondered about, um, you know, aside from the beautifully constructed things, do you, um, you know, Liz, when she was, for example, doing these nude photographs, And I I thought this was a a good kind of omission because it allowed the reader to visualize the whole scene themselves. But you don't go into a very graphic description of Liz's physicality. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if I wondered if it was to give us that that allowance, that space. Yeah, intentionally. That's right. We never really. I mean, her there's her sister, and I think maybe Richard also says, you know, you don't realize how beautiful you are. But I deliberately did not describe her. I just felt it was, it would take something away by, 
by filling in all the concrete. Like, we don't even know what color her hair is. And that was intentional. Only that it was highlighted after a while. That's right. (laughs) And, you know, I think think that's brilliant because it, it gives the reader the freedom Really, mm-hmm. to to visualize the whole, uh, just just to visualize, to go into another dimension completely, um, and I, I think it's also you know you you were talking about um, Liz before um, this photo session. She'd been afraid not of experiences that she'd had. There was a, a specific flashback that she had um, with a young man when she was still seventeen. Um, she was afraid of sleeping with this boy, this man, um, not for being hurt by him, but of finding out who else she might be. Um, Mm -hmm. So the way that she and all of us unconsciously imprison ourselves in the roles that we assign ourselves. And as you um, said before, you know, whether, you know, what the brilliant um, scholar and, you know, that's also a trap. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just, uh, I appreciate the fact that you've opened a lot of these doors for us. Um, and I wondered, you know, you're, you're living in the Hudson Valley, unlike what I erroneously said earlier, but okay, so you're in the Hudson Valley, a great place, a rich vein for artists, um, to, historically writers and artists to be. Um, Marina Abramovich um, is in Hudson, New York. She is the performance artist who sat at MoMA and encountered people one-on-one for her show called The Artist is Present. Um, And these are incredibly empowering ways where people um, use their bodies as part of their art, which, you know, has its own impact on us and, you know, brings us to a completely different level. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this kind of performance, but you really come very close to describing it in your book uh, called Queen of the Owls, which I hope everyone will pick up next month when it comes out. Um, and one one more point for you, Barbara Lynn Probst, and I, it's fascinating talking with you. Um, we're probably coming to the end of our segment here, but um, you talk about naming and I, I took a peek at your website, you know, because you have also this professional identity. Not that it seems to be a trap for you so much as almost a porous opening into your fictional work. Um you you were you you have a PhD in, in clinical uh, social work. Mm-hmm. And you talk about labels and the fact that labels are so inhibiting. Um, that diagnosis can be something where, you know, a person is labeled as, um, you know, bipolar or, you know, and some of these labels um, free people up and say, welcome to the tribe. For some people, it's something that's very dismissive. Um, And you advocate for the use of understanding um, each individual's interpretation of labeling and and metaphor. How has your professional work informed your your writing? It's so interesting. Yeah, you know, that's actually the title, Queen of the Owls, This is a Secret. It came from my work as a clinical social worker because um, I started out working with families of kids who were different, who were out of the box and got pathologized. And I also did a lot of research talking to people of what it was like to live with mental illness. So this whole thing about do you want to be beyond the label or with some people, as you said, the label gives them a sense of their tribe. So there was a woman that I interviewed years ago who was um, Asperger's syndrome, and this was a long time ago. And she was an amazing person because she told me, you know, I'm not like the other birds. I'm awake at night. I turn my head differently. I see differently. I'm like an owl, but I'm the queen of the owls. Wow. That's where that title came from. She embraced who she was. So so this was from my earlier profession. Yeah, you know, I taught at a university, and I, you know, did all that research and stuff like that. But my research was about talking to people. It wasn't number crunching. Right. And so this, this image of this woman um, it, stuck it with me. Yes, I'm so glad that you brought it forth and that your work informed 
you and us in such a beautiful way. I'm going to leave us with a passage from Queen of the Owls. Um, Making your unknown known is the most important thing, Georgia O'Keeffe says, and keeping the unknown always beyond you. Barbara Lynn Probst, it's been a pleasure. Queen of the Owls is available next month wherever books are sold. It's Barbara Lynn Probst, uh, www website. She's on Facebook and Instagram at Barbara Lynn Probst. Thank you, Barbara, for being with us. And everyone, please be safe out there. We'd love to join you again next week. Thank you. Thank you so much for dropping in. Please join Diane Dewey again next Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time and 11 a.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. We'll see you then. 